Hi, Alan. Hi, hi, Alan. How are you today? I'm fine, thanks. It's a great pleasure to have you here. Yeah, thank you very much for, for having me. So for giving me the opportunity to speak to you in uh, this your great post uh, podcast, which has become mainstream in OR. So really an honor to, to be able to speak here. Yeah, it's an honor for me too. So mm. today my guest is Alain Zemkoho. He's an associate professor in OR at the School of Mathematical Sciences within the University of Southampton, where he's affiliated to the OR group and COMSYS. He's an Alexander von Humboldt Experience Fellow between 2024 and 2026, a Fellow of the Institute of Mathematics and its Applications, a Fellow of the Higher Education Academy, and had been a Fellow of the Alan Turing Institute for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence between 2019 and 2023. His research interests revolve around continuous optimization with specific focus on bi-level optimization, stability analysis for parametric optimization, and machine learning modeling, theory, and numerical methods. He has published 40 papers around these topics and has secured grants totaling close to £2 million in full economic cost as principal investigator or co-investigator to fund some of his research. Alan also serves as a member of the EPSRC Peer Review College and of the OR Society Research Committee. Alan, thanks a lot for accepting the invitation. Um, looking forward to having this nice conversation with you. Thanks for the opportunity, Alan. I look forward to having a chat with you. Yeah. Thanks. So, Alan, you were born in 1978 in Cameroon. From which city or village do you come from? So, I was born in Bacham which is a village um, in the western region of Cameroon. Um, yeah. And for how long did you stay there? Uh, I stayed uh, with my parents in Bacham uh, till I was six, six years old, uh, when, I, when I, I left uh, to mm -hmm. somewhere else to start school, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, your family arrangement is quite peculiar. Could you briefly <laughs> explain it to our viewers and listeners? So um, the area of, of Cameroon where I come from, uh, polygamy is still very common. Uh, my dad had uh, six wives, uh, my mom probably the last wives, and yeah, with quite a few children. And um, yeah, so I got to know four of the wives of my, my dad. And um, yeah, quite a... <laughs> Big family, I would say. <laughs> uh -huh. Do you have an idea of how many siblings do you have? Probably around 20, I guess. <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. so. Right. And what did your dad do for a living? Uh, my dad was a farmer. So he farmed uh, coffee bean, beans. And he was also a businessman. So he traded um, things like um, cola nuts, his, um, the coffee he, beans he grew. So he traveled to different parts of the Western region of Cameroon to supply that to uh, different places. Um, yeah, that was the main, the main thing uh, he did, which seems uh, he was successful in that, apparently. Oh. <laughs> yeah. and, and what about your mom? Uh, my mom was a farmer, and she she still is. So she she still do. Does my mom is uh, about seventy plus now, but she she's a farmer. And she does she still does a bit of that uh, till till now. Wow. <laughs> Zem Koho is not your family name, correct? Um, basically, the the idea of family name, um, yeah. From I mean, mostly I guess in Cameroon and other parts of Africa, I guess. It's, I suppose, mostly Western kind of uh, traditions, right? So um, nowadays in Cameroon, many people would have family names, usually from the dad. But at the time I was born, um, that wasn't a thing. So my name is actually Zemko. It's not the name of my dad. It's the name of one of my dad's best friend, essentially. So uh, the, the, the naming lineage uh, from the part that I come from, it goes from the smallest nuclear family. Then when you expire the names of your direct 
parents, I mean, the, the grandparents of the child, say when you expire, the, the, the granddad, grandmom from both sides. And for someone like my dad who had many kids, so that expires very quickly. So you, you start to give the names of your best friends and that's a tradition which still goes on. So it's still the case, but now, with the influences of Western traditions, now um, younger parents, maybe well, like in their 50s, 60s, they will now have a family name of the dad, but the same tradition still goes. So typically people will have two names. So we still, one which, which is actually what is considered their name, <laughs> like mine. So if my, I was born around maybe 20 years ago, maybe I would have my dad's name and my Zenko, who that you know, probably very likely. So, uh, but at that time, that wasn't that so common, I would say. Right. So, uh, people in Cameroon will call you uh, Zemko or Alan? Uh, school, I, I, if I still remember quite well, in the schoolyard, probably we mostly probably would call um, uh, each other by our names. Like my close friends would call me Zems, kind of a short form uh, of Zem Koho uh -huh. or Alino, some kind of, you know, we always find ways not to call your direct name. So they always, um, yeah. So, so no, yeah, we commonly would call each other by our names, um, which what you would call last name, uh, but also maybe some, variants of your first name somehow yeah mm -hmm. uh and which language does your mother speak my mom speaks in gambo uh which is i mean cameroon has quite a variety of, of languages so yeah so which is one of probably 50 or 100 that you have in different areas of cameroon yeah so you you speak that language right Yes, but over time, yeah, my uh, proficiency in that has diminished over time because I speak that less and less. Yeah, but I still do with my mom and some of my uh, my siblings. I, I would still do that, but not that well, I would say. <laughs> I see. Uh, Alain, you moved quite a lot around the country. That all started around 1984 when you were six years old, as you mentioned in the beginning. Uh, hmm. Where did you go first? So yeah, when I, I got to the school age, which was six at the time, so I moved to small area at the time in the English speaking part of Cameroon called Mengri. That's where I started primary school, um, essentially, yes. What language do they speak there and did you learn the language? So um, where I went to school, where I started school in Bengui, the, the main language uh, spoken there uh, by the local uh, people from there was Meta. And I did learn it and I could speak it at the time. I was still young, so I could learn, uh, pick it up. Um, yeah, so, so I spoke Meta for some time, yes. So you... You went to Mbengui mostly for studying then, right? Uh, yeah, so no, I so basically I moved to Mbengui with one of the elder sons of my dad. So I went to live with him. Um, mm -hmm. My my dad, uh, they, 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 they arranged for me to go and live uh, with my um, one of the elder sons of my dad, who was a teacher and he had been um, transferred. He was a civil servant and he had been transferred from different part of the country to Mbengui. So I moved to stay with him uh, from that time, yes. Mm -hmm. mm. And what came after Mbengui? After Mbengui, we moved to another real, roughly, um, I would say small town of probably similar, similar size as Bengui, which was called Ndap, which is Ndap. Still called Ndap. Um, that's where I finished my primary school. Uh, I think that must have been around 88 if i remember correctly yeah mm -hmm. probably a different language and yes <laughs> yes but at the, by the time i had grown older so i didn't manage to um, maybe Ndop might have been a bit more open as a town so then you have influence of a bit more cosmopolitan i would say compared to bengui so you had an influence of multiple but the local air language there i think uh, was Bamunka, but as there are probably many places in the world. So because it's a bigger town, um, you have the confluence of, it's made of many different villages or 
place. So you would have quite a few different things. You have like four, it's a merger of more or less four different villages. And typically in Cameroon, each village more or less has its own language in some sense. <laughs> but Bamunka, I think, was the main one of the part that I, we, we, we lived in, I think, if I mm -hmm. remember correctly. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's not very different from India, for example, where my parents came from. So I can mm. understand more or less how it <laughs> how it feels to go uh, mm. to a different city, a different state, and then you have mm. a different language uh, script, and it can mm. be a bit hard and challenging mm. to adapt, mm. right? Mm. Uh, so you were you moved there around 1988, and Alan, it's impossible to talk about the 1990 World Cup in Italy without mentioning Roger Mila and the Cameroon national team. I remembered very vividly the match against Colombia in which Mila stole the mm. ball from René Iguita, that mm. legendary goalkeeper uh, from Colombia. And then, of mm. course, all the hype surrounding the Cameroon team. What was your impression from that World Cup? Ooh, um, the 1990 World Cup has had quite an immense influence in Cameroon. So even today, when I still travel uh, to different places, when it, when I tell people I'm from Cameroon, surprisingly, they still remember Roger Mila. Many, I mean, I, I still have it even till now. So which is, uh, we've had quite a few different footballers after that, but I think that one was really, um, it was it was big. It was, it was uh, and, and it's still, I think it's, it, re, it probably put Cameroon on the map, I would say. <laughs> I'm sure many people didn't know where Cameroon was at the time, I mean, by the time, so probably, yeah, it's, 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 it was big, I would say, yeah. Yeah, you, you mentioned where, uh, where is Cameroon in the map. If you take the map from Pangea, uh, mm. and interestingly enough, it, it connects directly with Paraíba, my state. Uh, so probably Jean Pessoa would be uh, directly connected with Cameroon, uh, and, you know, many, many, many years ago. So we, we might have this ancient geographic connection, probably. Um, and uh, I mean, I, I, as you said, that, that team was really remarkable. And I remember really, really well, it's actually one of my first memories of you know soccer and the world cup and and then the next world cup roger Milai scored a goal uh against mm. russia and i think he became the oldest player to ever score a goal in a world cup at the age of 42. you so, mean in 94 right 94 exactly yeah in and russia actually in 94 he was not in the squad there, there was an intervention of the president, I think, if I remember correctly, to get him to be added in the squad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because he was considered to be just to, to, to be too old by then. Um, yeah. Because you, you, you would remember even in 1990, he was already quite old. Uh, I mean, a bit of, not, not a very young player anymore at the time already. So. Yeah, right. Yeah. But it didn't look like he seemed to be really <laughs> young and not running. <laughs> Uh, up and down. Uh, you then moved to Bamenda around 1991. Mm, yeah, that, that's when I started secondary school. And the reason for that move was mainly because in Dob, so basically my, um, my schooling was done in French, uh, although we were living in the English speaking parts of Cameroon at the time. So Bamenda was the capital of the Northwest region, which is one of the English speaking parts of Cameroon. So that was the closest city where um, there was a um, high school where I could go to start high school. Yeah. Right. So then you started to have an English education uh, when you moved to Bamenda, correct? Uh, no, um, I, no, it was still so basically oh, the the uh, environment in Bamenda and Benguindop was more or less the same. They were all part of the same region, which is English speaking. But the schools that I went to were French speaking, essentially. So but the thing is, secondary school, uh, we didn't have one in Dop at the time where I could go and study in French. So yeah, so but but the 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 the, the difference probably with other places is in those part um, the English we were taught was significantly more advanced I would say so because in Cameroon I think still still probably the case um, because 
official language is French and English, so you have to do French and English in as long as possible, even till the university. So, but then there, because we were thought by really uh, very well, um, I mean, very good uh, English speaking teachers in, I mean, our English lessons, uh, but yeah. So I moved to Bameda because in Dob we didn't have a French speaking secondary school, right. but the school I moved to was bilingual, but essentially bilingual in the sense that you have like a combination of English and, and French, but more or less with two different tracks mm. in some sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In 1992, Cameroon experienced its first democratic presidential election. Hmm. Was it really democratic? <laughs> um, if, if, I mean, many people believe, um, I mean, in Cameroon today, it's openly talked about that opposition, an opposition party won, uh, which was called SDF. And actually the, the interesting part in, in relation to me is the leader of that party lived in Bamenda where I was doing my secondary school. So there was so much turmoil uh, there um, because the election was contested and uh, yeah, it was very rough <laughs> after the results. So basically they declared the guy who is still the president currently as we speak as a winner, but um, it's openly spoken about that opposition the opposition party uh, won, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. But 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 um, following that, we had quite a few years of turmoil. School um, had to stop for some times, and and so on. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Have you witnessed any dramatic event like really uh, in front of you, happening in front of you? Oh yeah, I mean, I still vividly remember when I was so in nineteen ninety two. I was in second year. But, um, basically what you would call year nine here in the UK, I think, or no, year eight, I think. So like second year of secondary school, essentially. So, and the day of the results, uh, we were at school and as soon as the results came out, the reaction was immediate. So my school was on top of a hill. So they, all the main leaders of the ruling party were attacked. If they knew where you lived, I mean, you, you were in serious, people were burning their houses. I mean, the people were known to be leaders of the the the, 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 the ruling party. And as there was one lady who was called Regina Mundi, uh, who was really one of the voices of the ruling party. So from the top of my school, as soon as the results were announced, there was fire coming from from how so we could see that from far distance uh, she was lucky she was not in so she was the people who were met at home were essentially burnt <laughs> so, so it was it was um it was strange but yeah it was because because the, the Bamenda was like really like the I would say one of the focus points uh, of opposition because the leader lived there that was where he lived and um, so the the turmoils that followed the election were very intense. So we had to stop school for quite some time uh, around that period. Um, yeah. Wow. So Alan, did your sense of awareness about the world improved in the 90s? Uh, I would say 90s. Hmm. Uh, as you probably would know, around the 90s, countries like Cameroon were still, I mean, we're still probably relatively young countries in the, in the country in a sense uh, we were just about 30 years after independence so still trying to build a state uh the influences of things going on in places like south africa us and so on i mean a lot of books that we we, we, we come across uh, that were kind of intensely talked about or read were about the colonization and things like that. So, 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 yeah, we were opening up. You, you had media um, kind of things, a lot of things going on, and yeah, the awareness was was growing. Uh, people were trying to fight for for their rights. Um, yeah, the, the, the 1992 first election, but before that, 1990, we had the first political parties of kind of like because until 1990 in Cameroon there was just 
um, what was called party unique. So there was just one party that was allowed officially. So in 1990, first opposition parties were created and it was in some serious turmoil as well. And Bamenda wasn't probably the best place to be all the time, uh, which was where I was. And because the main opposition party at the time was burned there actually. So um, yeah, so we were a bit, uh, had some international focus because of all those things. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. It is no secret that life can be very tough for the populations of many African countries. In your case, how was access to things like basic sanitation? Uh, yeah, I think already already around that time when I was growing up, um, so basically in, in Cameroon, I mean, probably as I guess in many African countries, the wealth gap is probably huge. Um, I would say the disparities are really um, quite, 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 quite large. So, so you, you, you have people who are wealthy would have anything that you can have uh, in, in, in any um, country in the West and maybe far more than that. But you have people, the common people, as you would say, yeah, who would um, yeah, struggle for, for most things. I would say standard. I mean, the, the common type of sanitation we would have probably even today, I would guess. Um, so basically, typically, the way we build houses in Cameroon would be you'd have a main house where you live, but sanitations are built like a separate apartment outside because you know the cost to incorporate base sanitation in the main uh, building, it, it's, it's a bit expensive. So um, typically that would be the standard, things like the kitchen and the basic sanitation, anything that if you build incorporate, incorporating in the main house would be expensive. People will be that as a separate entity with the house. So typically, um, I mean, till some time, probably in, main, in big cities, that would hardly be the case now. People would have to build because of land and stuff, but most places it's made of different pieces, probably separate from each other. to make it easy to make basic sanitation um, because it's much cheaper that way. Um, yeah. And what did you do to have fun in those days? Of course, football. <laughs> football was our main um, recreational activity. I played football as any other kid um, everywhere at school, at home. And also I did a lot of crafting. So I would build um, all sort of things, little toy cars. So there was one um, material that was very present. You know, I think you probably know bamboos, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we, we use them to build all sort of crafts. Um, I enjoy building cars <laughs> and, and, and use um, plastic materials to build the tires and, and so on. So I did a lot of crafting um, when I was a kid. Uh, it was really fun. I, I still remember those experiences, played a lot of football. Uh, we, we played, I mean, we, we were very, you know, with the influences of France. We played Scrabble type games a lot as well. Uh, maybe some cards and maybe some, some also very traditional type of um, activities that we, that we did. Um, yeah, it was, it was quite <laughs> interesting. Interesting, mm -hmm. a lot of interesting things that we yeah. did, which are probably quite different experiences that you would have in like where I am now, I guess. And uh, what about dancing and, you know, going to parties? Uh, mm. Were you this type of person that will go there and enjoy yourself, you know, hang out <laughs> with friends? Oh, yes, definitely. So, yes, I am um, in the school when I, especially from secondary school, dancing was... Uh, was really a big thing. I mean, um, choreographies from a lot of uh, kids at, of my age, I actually played a bit. I, I loved, um, but the, the type of rhythm that I liked the most probably was rap. I uh, love I love rapping. Not sure I did much of choreography, but I entertained being a rapper at some point of my life. Yeah, but yeah, but we, we listened to quite a varied range of, of music um, in Cameroon itself. We had very 
typical um, types of music. We had like something called Makosa, which is still very popular from the coast. We had Bikutsi. Uh, and then from the area where I am from, we had Benskin. This Benskin actually came from English, I would, as I would suppose. Um, but we also have international influences when we are at school from um, DRC, which was called ZAI at the time. I think you, you probably know the Democratic Republic of Congo, one of the bands which mates from my school, they organized choreographies around where it was called Zaiku Langa Langa, which was very popular. Um, we had things from Ivory Coast. Uh, Mewe was also one of the artists that we we really um, enjoyed for, for, for quite a while. Um, yeah, but we have, we have influences from the U.S. as well, rap, especially rap. People from my mates um, did a lot of, you would have um, Tupac, uh, well, some French, black uh, French artists like MC Solar were also very popular um, when I was uh, at school. Um, yeah, so, so there was, it was very a wide range of things, I would say, um, influences, yeah. yeah. And then wow. I did a bit of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you're really into music um, and, and then some activities surrounding uh, mm -hmm. music, yeah, yeah. And what about mm -hmm. movies? So yeah, with regards to, to, to movie, yeah, so um, yeah, we, we, we started, we, we had quite a, quite a lot of um, an emerging local movie industry sponsored by the state, which was something we really enjoyed. But from when we got close to 2000s, uh, you, we started having quite a lot of international influences and, and so on, um, yeah, which um, to, to probably took over <laughs> uh, for some time, yeah. You moved again around 1998, correct? Yes. Um, so, as you remember, I mentioned that till yeah, around 1990, 91, I was in Dub, where I, I finished my primary school. I moved to Bamenda. So, by I think 1998, 1999, um, the, the son of my dad was my guardian, uh, was um transferred again to to, to now to a french-speaking uh city well, probably the third largest city in cameroon called bafusam in the western part which is a part where i'm originally from so then i have to move back there where i did my a levels um because they um they had one of the the son of my dad that i was living with uh was transferred to 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 to, to bafusam uh, which is the third largest city in Cameroon. So that's where I need train speaking. So I could do my A-levels there um, in, in 1919, the, the school year, 1998, 1999, essentially, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, by that time, were you sure that you wanted to go to university? Oh, I'm not sure how much thought I had about it at the time. <laughs> but yeah, by the time I did my A-level, yeah, I was... Uh, I wanted to go to university, um, but by the time university, yeah, was, I mean, we had quite a wide range of universities in Cameroon at the time, and it was uh, seriously considering yeah, to, to go to one of them, yeah. Mm -hmm. And why did you return to Bamenda around 2000? So um, the year 1999-2000 was um, like a gap year where I moved back to Bamenda to prepare to go to university, yeah. So you left Bamenda uh, to start university elsewhere, correct? Yes. So yeah, I left Bamenda after the gap year uh, to study university at, uh, in Chang. And um, yeah, so I started in October 2000, I think. Yeah, I started university at Chang, yeah. Yeah, to study mathematics and computer science, is that yes. correct? Yes, mm -hmm. so I started a bachelor in uh, mathematics and computer science at the University of Chang, yeah. Did you have access to computer at home? No. Um, my first computer probably oof, was probably around 2004, maybe, three, four, maybe. I can't remember exactly. Yeah, so towards maybe the end of my time, I recall normal superior of Yaoundé in that. Mm-hmm. Uh, is it true that you were part of a computer club? 
Uh, yeah, so um, the time at the University of Chang was quite interesting because it, 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 we had a, a computer lab there. And so basically the, the studies at, uh, in that department, you, you had foundational year, I think, which was the first, and, I mean, foundational years, first and second year where we had a joint program. And then the third year, we would have split it to the maths you would have a bachelor in math or in computer science. So the computer science enthusiasts. So uh, by the time we arrived, people preceded us. They created a computer club, which was really great. So it gave me an opportunity to spend quite a lot of time in the lab, start building some some games. I, I really, <laughs> it was the first time I started really actively using the computer and play a bit with programming, um, I would say. Mm -hmm. You did not stay in Chang for very long, right? No, um, I think in Cameroon, and I would assume it would still be the case, education is structured largely a bit like in France, where um, you have this grand école system, which gives you direct access to train in a specific field, and then possibly direct access to a job. So most people, when they go to university, they are preparing this entrance exam to the grand école. Uh, if you manage to get into one of the grand call at the time, you know, you're more or less, you have a job guaranteed because you'll be come. So during the time in Chang, I prepared the entrance to Ecol Normal uh, in a Paistip, and then I left Chang to Yaoundé to, to, to do my training um, at Ecol Normal Superior Yaoundé. Yeah. Mm. Yaoundé is the capital of Cameroon? Yes. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Were you satisfied with the education you had uh, in Yaoundé? Uh, yes. I mean, we, we had really very good um, lecturers, professors in mathematics. Um, so we uh, both at Ecole Normale and at, uh, because I, as I said, I started at Ecole Normale and then continued at the University um, of Yaoundé. Um, I think the only thing I would say is the, the range of subjects that you would study, um, you would do all the fundamentals of mathematics, uh, but a lot of modern topics, I would say, were not present. So the the, 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 the programs were not very broad when you start to get to your final stages. Um, yeah, so, so that's probably the main criticism I have. But in terms of training, yeah, we were really trained. I think we have very good um, professors. Uh, both at uh, both schools, um, I think that's where I got my basic training from. That's great. You met your future wife around that period. Yes, uh, yes. Why in Yaoundé? But okay, we knew each other already from Bamenda. We were very very young. So in Yaoundé, we were living in the student area uh, together. So we we started dating um, maybe around two thousand three. Or maybe I don't know, <laughs> some somewhere around that. But we knew each other already from 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 Bamenda when I was um, going to school there. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, because, yeah, her parents were from there as well. Mm. Mm -hmm. You got several degrees until you obtained an equivalent to a master's degree in two thousand seven. Yes. So basically, um, so in Cameroon, I, I don't know how it is in France where we kind of copied the system from. Um, when you did the training in Ecole Normale, what you get, it was never equivalent to a university degree. So, when, so that's when in parallel, when we, you, we were completing the third year as um, in Ecole Normale, where we were being trained to be maths teachers. If you wanted to follow the path to continue um, at the academic path, you have to go to, to the university to do a degree. So besides my... Um, teaching diploma, I also did a bachelor of, in mathematics, and then a master's, and then uh, what we, we call at the time diploma uh, d'études approfondies in mathematics, so which is essentially yeah, post-bachelor, maybe two years roughly. So each year you had a different <laughs> degree essentially, which you could live with if you wanted to, but I already knew I need I wanted to do a PhD. Um, so I had I, yeah, I, I just continued doing uh, all that I had on my way to to to, to be able to get to, to that stage. And what was the topic of your master's dissertation? 
So master, my master dissertation was in uh, on bi-level optimization, essentially, yes. Uh, but just because I I I was lucky at the time to to I got I, I became aware of a professor in the computers. So my department was just uh, kind of um, linked with the computer science department. There were two separate departments, and there was a, a professor there who had did, done her training in the US, and she was a computer scientist, and she was specialized in optimization. And I knew someone who told me, oh, it's doing some very nice applied stuff, and um, I signed up with her to do my master dissertation. Yeah. Uh, but how, how did you find the topic? Uh, you said that you were not actually taught modern uh you know subjects at a time yeah, yeah. Yeah. so basically in my math department the most professors there they were um, analysts they were doing analysis so you, the, they, they would do what you would call applied maths but very theoretical they would do partial differential equation some fundamental math subject like algebra and and things like that most of them were, were analysts uh they would do they would do a lot of but um so basically most of my mates they would do they, they did um analysis or algebra as part of their masters but um i from my 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 nature is that when i essentially i'm somewhere and everybody does the same thing it just makes me mad so so i had to get out of it somehow so so i did so i, I got to, to know this professor in computer science and i was allowed to go i was not the first who did that so i had someone who had done the same and i became aware of that and then i said this is probably what i need to do so because i i to the the the, 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 the professor had met stefan dempe who later became my PhD advisor at a conference, if I remember correctly. And I think he gave her his book to Stefan Dempe, who became my um, PhD um, advisor, had a very, has a very famous book on bi-level optimization. I think she had a copy that if you told her you wanted to do something in optimization, she was just handing it to you to, <laughs> to do whatever you wanted to do with it. So that's that's how. Um, so I had to leave my department to do something different, essentially. Yeah. Right. And, and luckily, we were allowed to do that, though it was not in the same department. But yeah, we were allowed to do it. Uh huh. Did you have online access to journal papers? Uh, in general, no. So mainly. To have journal papers, we had we often contacted the the authors to ask for papers. Sometimes they would send them to us, or maybe if you want to access things online, we had a lab, but I don't think it was connected to the internet at the time. So we needed to go to cyber cafes uh, to to access internet to maybe get a few freely available uh, journals and so on. Um, I think that's mostly we had a library. But we had most of the books were quite old books, so yeah, so that's how we, we kind of uh developed our knowledge at the time. Um, yeah, wow, so you had to, to go to cyber cafes and contact the authors to get the original copies of the papers, yeah, uh, it's yeah. quite a and, and at the time, as you would know, we didn't yet have things like archive where you could even have preprints of papers. I think that's something quite recent. Um, so yeah, yeah, you were lucky. You get some free maybe books or papers, or we contact the authors. Um, yeah, the libraries were not updated at a pace where yeah, such topics you could easily find books on them. There, I, I think. Of course, if I did something like analysis or algebra, probably I could have found some good books in the library that we had. But for something like optimization, which is even still today in Cameroon, not that so much present. I would say, at least in the maths, maybe in computer science, you would have few people who do that, I guess. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. You wrote your dissertation in LaTeX. Yes. That was my first experience with LaTeX. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's a um, fun one, but in French. <laughs> at the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, you met some Brazilian guys from IMPA uh, in, in Benin or Benin in 2007, mm. right? 
Yes, that was at the time I already, I had already had my mission to do, go and do my PhD in Germany, uh, but it was probably my first conference. Um, I would, I think, if I remember correctly, that I actually the first time I traveled out of Cameroon, um, and the conference was jointly organized by um, EMSP, which is a, a maths and physics uh, sciences institute in Benin. And um, the main research funding uh, organization in Brazil. And I think the Brazilian delegation was headed by Alfredo Isium. I don't know whether you would know him. Mm -hmm. He was one of the main, I think he might be retired now, one of the main uh, optimization researchers at IMPA. Um, yeah, so I met quite a few guys that I later discover that they were really, at the time I didn't realize how big they were because <laughs> I was still a novice uh, in, in research, right? Yeah, so so there was quite a big delegation of the optimizers of, from, from, from Brazil, not just from IMPA, uh, but I think it was mainly led from IMPA, uh, I think Alfredo Isium and a few people, but we have people from I think San Catarina or mm -hmm. I think, yeah, I think if Santa I remember, Catarina, yes. Yes. yes, yeah, we, we had people from a few different universities in Brazil uh, who came and uh, yeah, we had like a week or so. It was quite interesting, I would say. <laughs> yeah, that's very interesting yeah. indeed. Um, mm -hmm. And then that was probably your first experience uh, outside Cameroon. Yes, yes. Uh, but just um, after that, a few weeks later, I moved to Germany um, for my PhD. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was about to ask, uh, how did you end up in Germany? I know you did your PhD with Seth and Dempe, uh, but uh, how was, you know, the process of getting admitted there? So basically, since my PhD was in bilateral optimization and my uh, supervisor already knew Stefan Dempe, which I think he probably knew her as well. So actually already I started communicating with Stefan Dempe when I was doing my master's thesis already. So probably I think he probably sent me some some papers as well. And I think the decision for him to accept me as PG student wasn't probably a hard one, I think. <laughs> because we, we had communicated for quite a bit um before that. Um yeah so we were really quite um yeah, right. In, in, in continuous contact. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was your first time leaving Africa. How was the adaptation process? Um, yeah, that's true. Um, I said my first experience just leaving Cameroon actually was in Benin just a few weeks before. Then, uh, to talk about the experience in Germany, yeah, it was it was um, it was um, I would say completely different environment language <laughs> i had to I had to learn german um it was quite there were a lot of things that i needed to get to to settle down because um I, most of my training i mostly didn't do optimization at all so already on the academic side yeah i had a lot to to learn uh the language i had to learn german then I had to adapt the coal. <laughs> yeah, so there was just quite a few different challenges, I would say, um, that I had to, to, to address when I moved to Germany. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you have to share the apartment with uh, other students or? Um... Yes, I think my first apartment was actually um, organized by Stefan Dempe. I think if I remember correctly, just by not like two, three minutes from where his office was, actually. Yes, I, and it was a shared apartment with a few uh, guys. Um, I think we were probably four of us, if I remember correctly. But, I mean, we each had our rooms and we had a shared kitchen, maybe shared um, sanitation and things like that, yeah. Were there any cultural clashes? Uh, probably, I, I would say... I think they were mostly university students. I think, I mean, it was it was quite a um, yeah different experience. I would say, right? I just remember one day one of my um, apartment mates asking me, "Oh, in Cameroon, do you guys live in houses and and things like that?" <laughs> Which was quite a strange question, right? Uh -huh. And I I I thought um, 
I didn't really hear what he said. I, what do you mean? So it was, it was, um, yeah, you know, all these cliches about Africa. Probably many people think that people there live, I don't know, maybe on the trees I <laughs> or in bushes or whatever. So, so I guess, yeah, I probably just, but, but I think I later discovered that it was not, um, was probably not, he was not a university student, he was a very young kid. I think he was, uh, training kids to swim or whatever, maybe just some lack of knowledge or whatever. I don't know. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So they overall, did they treat you properly? Uh, I would say nothing. I would say, um, unusual. I moved a few apartments for some time. I still shared maybe another one or two apartments later on, uh, because they, we have this shared apartment system in universities in Germany, which was common, at least where I was, but often you have to have a joint contract. So often if somebody's leaving, if you don't find someone to replace them, you have to all move. So I moved maybe two or three times. Um, yeah, the integration was, it was, it was tough. I would say, um, one of the main, uh, things I would remember was it felt like maybe because you were not really connected to your, your, your apartment mates, you always felt like maybe you would be blamed for most things that would happen in the apartment. Um, uh, yeah, part of that, um, yeah, I think it was mostly all right, I, I would say. Uh, what did you study in your PhD? My PhD is on continuous bi-level optimization. So I just continued, but now um, I really got into becoming a proper optimizer, I would say. from I went from a background which was strongly analysis, very pure mathematics, to something a bit more practical. And it was really interesting to see how bi-level optimization as a, as a topic was quite broad in terms of applications you could have and the range of mathematics that you need to develop things. Um, yeah, but yeah, it was, it focused more on the theoretical aspects of bio optimization. Um, yeah. So, uh, Stackelberg games um, mm, and mm, things mm, like that. Mm. Yes. So, um, uh, optimization problem is essentially, although when you look at the, 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 the history of the field, uh, we, we attribute uh, it to, to Stackelberg, uh, but yeah, but things kind of can be slightly different. So yeah, I think it's a combination of Stackelberg was probably definitely the first guy to the best uh, of what we know to introduce uh, these problems of this type of structure where you have um, the, the, the rules of the game or that uh, there's an order of play. So you... You don't play simultaneously. There has to be a player who plays first, who plays the role of the leader, and then you have the, the other player who reacts. So it originated from economic game theory. Then it got um, into the field of optimization around early seven, the early 70s, um, I think, maybe from a different different area as well, maybe semi-infinite programming uh, and so on. And it developed uh, quite fast from then. Right. And what can be considered the main contribution of your PhD work? So in my PhD, um, it was essentially about writing optimality conditions for bi-level optimization problems. So I um, just look at a problem. I mean, in in, in standard continuous optimization, um, I guess many people will know the KKT conditions, which are KKT stands for Karish Kun and Tucker. Uh, who introduced um, uh, these optimality conditions for continuous um, optimized standard continuous optimization? So what I was trying to do, essentially, in my PhD, is to look at different angles on how you can formulate um, condition of the type of these KKT conditions in the context of. A continuous bio optimization, but I look at different angles, optimistic, pessimistic, and 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 so on. So so that was the main um, main work of my PhD. Yeah. So it was mostly theoretical work. It was just theoretical and <laughs> <laughs> theoretical work. Yes. And when did you get married? Uh, two thousand and nine. 
uh, in the middle of my kind of like essentially my PhD. So yeah, 2009. Yeah. You spent a couple of months in the US during your PhD. How was the experience? Yeah, it was, it was, it was, I think, a really great experience. Um, so by, I think it was, um, yeah, I, I travel, I think it was January, 2011, I think like, um, yeah, um, yeah, somewhere around, yeah, towards maybe the end. And it was a, it was a great experience. It was still quite deep in the winter. I thought when I was traveling to Detroit that, um, it was very cold in Freiburg where I did my PhD and we had a lot of snow. But in Detroit, I think maybe the snow was even worse at the time in January, February time, the time I spent there. And I visited uh, Boris Mordokovic, who is a very famous um, variation analyst. And the very interesting, the academic side of it is most of the tools that I was using to develop my theoretical work in my in my uh, in my PhD were introduced by him. Most of those tools, so it was it was really uh, a privilege to get the opportunity to go and work with him for some time. And we 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 wrote a few papers together. We are still in touch regularly today. So it became really. Um, it was like my second PhD advisor in some sense. <laughs> uh, yeah, he was also my external examiner. And um, yeah, so it was, it was quite a nice experience. Um, I think he had some influence on my career, um, a positive one, of course, um, I'm sure. Yeah. So despite the winter, you had a really great time in Detroit. <laughs> Yeah, I say it was it was very cold, um, but I already experienced a lot of cold in Freiburg. But I thought it might be, but it was equally maybe more snow in Detroit at the time than than in, I had. I left in Freiburg behind me <laughs> because yeah, where, where, where it was winter and you know, and and both 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 places at the time. Did you travel elsewhere during the PhD? Oh yeah, Oof. I went to so many conferences. I um, I mean. Every opportunity I had, <laughs> I use it. I, I traveled to quite a few. I, I, I visited Spain a few times, Portugal, well, US. I traveled Switzerland. I, I and 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 I think maybe when I I reflect on it today, uh, I think uh, Stefan Dempe was was very generous with me because I, I mostly wasn't the one paying for those trips so um yeah maybe it was a sign that maybe i was doing something well but because he paid for almost all my trips and uh, i think i took the opportunity to to really develop uh, my um presentation side networking and so on and i guess that probably helped me um after the phd i guess to, to proceed to the next stages of my career. Yeah, I, I went to quite a few conferences, yes. Yeah, amazing. Mm. And as you said, you attended several academic events during your PhD and you have mm. just shared the positive side of attending the several conferences. Do you have any negative experiences to share? Probably, I mean, uh, most of often, as you, you know, the the atmosphere at conferences you know, is always really fun. And what, one thing Stefan Dempe told me once is his experience at traveling to conferences is you build friendship with a lot of people that you, you always meet at the other conference. And it's, it's it, they become long-term friends. And I'm, it's today that I'm really understanding it that so well uh, for with, with, with my experience as well. But so it was really generally uh, really, really fun experience. But if I could think of a negative, it would just be once actually somewhere in Germany. Uh, we had a very small conference. Uh, I can't remember which year it was, maybe 2010, maybe where uh, we were at a very small conference. I had some professors. I was still a student then. We were, we were just chatting. They were asking me questions. We we're talking about Africa more generally. <laughs> and and, and, and I, I, I realized people start poking fun at, oh, in Cameroon, do you have like, are flies or ants massive like <laughs> it kind of start to I, I didn't know where these cliches come from that in in Africa or in Cameroon the, the flies or the ants would be so massive and it felt so strange to me 
that such uh, professors at, at such level, very senior, they would think things like that. They would be having so much fun. Um, they, I mean, a lot of strange things we, we said during during the, the, the event. People say, oh, I can't go for holiday at this place because oh, probably um, I wouldn't get this. Maybe I'd rather go to, yeah, I don't remember all those things. But probably that was probably the strangest experience that I, that I will remember, I would say. Uh, maybe it was just because of the nature of the event, because we were stuck together in a very small hotel somewhere in the middle of nowhere for some days. <laughs> maybe there was not much to, to do around there. Yeah, I think probably, right. yeah. So in general, except for this one or two occasions, you <laughs> you never felt in an inferior position uh, in, in any academic event because of your African origins? Um, I think that's a bit of a challenging topic because I'm not, I'm not sure how good I am at detecting those things, but um, I guess I, I try as much as I can to focus on what I need to do. <laughs> but, uh, because I, I think, you know, these sort of things, they, um, they can be very subtle and it's always hard to say because, I mean, when you talk to people, generally you would have different experiences on all sort of different things. And things, many things, I mean, you, you are not on pe in people's head to know what they are thinking. For. So I try really not to think too much about things, uh, I would say. Um, the, those few experiences I mentioned are the one where you could see, obviously, because, I mean, if someone doesn't openly say something, right, uh, to you, uh, it's hard to make much of it, right? Um, so, so I wouldn't really. Um, it's hard to characterize things. So I don't think too much about things. I just do what I need to do, uh, wherever I, I I I go. I think, and um, yeah, mm. mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Uh, you finished your PhD in 2012. What came next? Yeah. The same year that I have also finished mine. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Yeah, so I, at the time, uh, my PhD advisor gave me a nine-month postdoc, uh, which I later understood was a training for me <laughs> to, <laughs> to move on to the next stage. Um, then, so I stayed in Freiburg for another nine months. Then I moved to Birmingham. That's 20, early 2013. That's where I moved to the UK. And uh, I've been there since then. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, and how was the process of, you know, looking for uh, postdoc positions, applying for a job? Um, mm. Was it smooth or yeah. you struggled? No, it was, it was a challenging process because I think I was one of those who just sat there, did what they had to do research-wise. I was enjoying it so much, trying writing papers. And I just kept doing that until the time I got my, because when I was wrapping up my PhD, my supervisor had already planned this job for me and he, we already discussed that. So I never really thought much. It's when I got to it and I realized, okay, you have just this amount of time that I said, oh, I need to start looking for jobs. <laughs> It was quite a stressful process, I would think. And and my German wasn't that so... I, I did German, I, I learned, I, and I, I had a certificate. But I didn't... Because I was doing my, my research in English, of course, my German was good enough to go around, shop, talk a bit to people. But I'm not sure how good it was to go really go into a position where you could... And, and, and also, even for Germans, Academic positions are, are are tough even today. So uh, somehow I have to start looking international. Um, yeah, I, I applied for a few postdoc positions. There weren't that many in Germany anyway. I I didn't have any interview um, then, and I also I wasn't really in a state of mind where I was constrained doing any work other than going to into into research because i enjoyed uh doing the research in my phd so yeah i came across this website here in the uk where most of the academic positions are posted and surprisingly yeah i applied not for many and i had so many interviews i had three interviews 
I think most positions that I applied for uh, in the UK, I had an interview for them. So, and that's how yeah, I, I, I moved. Um, yeah. Mm. Did you change research directions in Birmingham? Yes. Um, in, in Birmingham, I was working on optimization problem with second order conic constraints. And the focus of the job was essentially programming, which was also quite a big challenge because I had gone from a position where my my lat, my latest my my the last times I programmed was mostly when I started university. That was already many many years ago. My PhD was essentially theoretical, and um, but I think it was probably as I did a year and a half in Birmingham, but I think it influenced my work subsequently so when i left birmingham to southampton i came back to buy on bio level optimization and i think it helped me frame my understanding of programming or developing algorithm from a numerical side of things um, i learned the trade in terms of putting algorithms together implementing them and but it was hard <laughs> it was hard <laughs> But, but but it was quite a learning learning process, and I think most of my um, work on numerical methods or bio optimization probably um, really the thinking about them started from there. I would say. Yeah, so it was a very complementary experience. Exactly. You don't have to code but, and mm, go into the algorithms, mm, uh, mm, and mm, that gave mm, you mm, a very nice background from the numerical mm, side, and then mm, I'm sure that helped you in, in their exactly, next exactly. endeavors for sure. Yeah. And how did you find a position at the University of Southampton in 2014? So um, my position in Birmingham, I think was meant for 18 months or two years, something like that. So around that time, I had to know the UK market in terms of academic jobs a little bit. Um, so I kept, yeah, applying to prepare the next, the next phase. And um, yeah, I, I, I got quite a few rejections as well. And then um, luckily there was this one, this, it was a two year position at the time in, in Southampton. And um, I got offered an interview and it was quite a fun experience because it was the first time where I went for a job interview and by the time I reached home, they had called me to make me an offer. <laughs> <laughs> it was quite a quite an interesting one. Um, yeah, and that's how I got there. And eventually, about a year after, there was a permanent position open in the same department. And I applied and uh, I've been there since. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you took the office of Maria Batarra. Is that right? Oh, yes, yes, yes. I'm not sure it was Maria I was replacing at the time. I forgot the story, but the office I took, yeah, essentially Maria was moving at the time to uh, Bath, if I remember yes. correctly. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, so yeah. Yeah, and then uh, she actually left um, her desktop with me to return to the department at the time because mm. she, she, she had been, yeah, it was quite um, big. Uh, piece of pieces of uh, stuff. So yeah, so yeah, I, I the office, and I'm still in the office, the same office till today. <laughs> yeah, I, ha I have a little fun fact. I visited the University of Southampton in 2012. Mm -hmm. I was there for a week, and I was visiting oh, Maria, and mm -hmm. I was working at that very office. <laughs> All right, with this view, right? You yeah. Know, when people get into my office, they always enjoy the view which is very nice in the winter especially because yeah. you don't have too much sun but in this in the in the summer can be a bit of a pain because yeah. it gets so hot inside yeah but small world isn't it yeah 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 it's quite <laughs> quite quite nice to very know. interesting yeah. yeah so now you had to teach apply for grants supervise students and so on how challenging was that for you I think the biggest challenge, okay, I, I think probably something which I did, which I guess probably helped me even learn the job I, I got in, in Southampton is my job searching process when I was in Tribeck made me, so during the postdoc year I had, um, six, nine months I had, um, my PhD advisor, uh, Stefan Dempe, gave me the opportunity to teach a course uh, to master students so I could do that in English. But also when I moved to Birmingham, by then I've learned quite a bit too. So I, I, I asked 
to volunteer in Birmingham to teach a course as well. Uh, so I had already learned, I mean, developed some experience at teaching, but still, um, when I moved to the, the, one of the main challenges when I started my uh, full-time academic position in, in, in a balanced pathway, which involved both teaching and research, the challenge was um, kind of developing new course, I mean, new material or new courses, sometimes topics you don't know much about, and you can imagine the amount of time it takes. So, so it was quite um, a significant undertaking, I would say, and then there was uh, EPSRC that you mentioned at the beginning. They had a starting run for new academics, uh, which was called First Grant at the time. And that grant you could only apply by, I think, the end of your probation, if I, if I remember correctly. And the probation here is between two and three years. It means, and I think mine was two, if I remember correctly. So it means by the end of my two years, I had to submit this grant application and beside all the teaching and then trying to stabilize yourself with, 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 with research. And I hadn't left bi-level optimization for some time during my postdoc in, in, in Birmingham. So, and I managed to draft an application which was successful, uh, which was really a good um, accelerator for my career, I would, I, I would say. So it gave me really um, that framework to dive deep into algorithms. So I had my first postdoc, which we, we joined forces together and I started really actively working on algorithm. And I think that's been really very helpful for my career yeah. since then. Mm. And, and it seems that you were very much motivated by a paper uh, that <laughs> somewhat uh, puts your work in a in, uh, difficult position. Yeah, yeah. So basically, I remember so there was a paper I read um, by some. So at the time I was doing my PhD, there was, and even maybe now the group, I don't know whether it's still very active. There was a big group of very uh, top guys at Montreal, uh, which was led by Patrice Marcotte and Gilles Savard. Um, so they were really like the top guys in bio optimization. But their work was unlike with my advisor, Stefan Dempe, where he did algorithmic, algorithmic work, but more on a theoretical side. But the Marcotte and Gilles Savard and even Martin uh, Labbé that you had uh, in one of your podcasts, mm -hmm. I think they had a lot of collaboration. So their work was more on the algorithm. It's very applied work. They applied uh, bio optimization a lot in transportation. And I think um, bio optimization became quite prominent, I guess, in part thanks to their work because they had a lot of papers um, in, in that area. So in one of the, their papers, they, they they wrote, um, I don't remember the exact authors, but I think Patrice Marcot was one of them. They said that, oh, there's this category of work which is done by these guys, and they cited my PhD advice, which was the sort of work I would I was doing. They said, but it's not really useful in practice. <laughs> something, <laughs> I'm paraphrasing here, but sure, something sure. along those lines, which I felt so bad about it, because you can see my, my, my path going from very pure math background, which I left because I wanted to do applied work. I went in to do my master's thesis mm -hmm. with a computer scientist because I, I really wanted to see how these things, they work in practice. I went into bi-level, which is very applied, but I still focus on the, on the, on the theoretical side. And then I got something like that and I, I felt I took it as a challenge um, that I, the next time I have the opportunity, I have to show how the theory I've been developing can help in practice to solve the problem. And I think that has pushed me since then. So my first paper on numerical methods and bio optimization, which is part of this my project that I mentioned uh, with EPSRC, was developing Newton methods for bio optimization. And I think it's probably, um, I guess, the first paper which which did that. So. What I did was just find the kind of from the whole of loads of optimality condition I had developed in my thesis or work on or around in my thesis, how can I best identify a system 
on which I can build a method, like a Newton method. And it was really motivated by that paper that I'm going to show that this thing can work. And um, yeah, it's it's um, it, it, it. I think it was it was it was a good push <laughs> for me and kind of led to some very interesting experience, I would say. So that's part of the game, uh, mm. pun intended. <laughs> you know, mm. uh, and and researchers might have different perspectives, but uh, looking at the bright side, that can encourage uh, sort of a healthy competition, and maybe one group want to show that they can do better. So uh, you took it from the positive uh, perspective, I would say, and you're doing extremely well, and, and that's very, very nice. So Alain, bi-level optimization is becoming increasingly popular. How close are we from having a bi-level society? Yeah, so um, yeah, I've been working with a few colleagues um, from many places, many that you probably would know. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to start saying name because I'll probably forget many. <laughs> um, yeah, many prominent guys were working around bilateral optimization to try to put a society together. So that um, so we sent out a call uh, from the the conference we we organized in uh, since um, in, in in I think last year, someone last year. Uh, we we sent a call to get people to register their interests. Uh, and I think we had quite a positive response. We have over 100, maybe 20 or 30 people who showed their interest in something like that. So we are currently working to do work on the constitution and so on. And so we, we, we will be applying for the society to be a technical section of the mathematical optimization society. So we hope to get that happen hopefully by the end of this year, so get that uh, completely done and the society being active. Um, so there, there's a lot going on, especially um, I'm so impressed how the field has been developing in the field of machine learning, for instance. So um, yeah, we, 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 we are looking to get a framework where you can get people talk to each other, maybe exchange ideas and push things um, forward at a yeah, uh -huh. paste that can yes. yeah. A forum essentially. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. So over the years you started doing more applied work. Uh could mm. you mention a few examples connecting your work with the industry? Yes. So so I've been trying to touch on different things um the last probably five, six, maybe seven years now. Uh besides my core bilateral optimization work, which is largely focused on developing algorithms these days, um, and also trying to touch a bit on machine learning. Uh, as I just said, machine learning, um, there are a lot of applications um, which uh, require, I mean, bilateral optimization has been applied to do all sorts of things. But on the side, I, so I, I would define my research as to be along, along these three streams, I would say bilateral optimization, uh, some work on theory and applications of machine learning, and also some very practical application of OR or a mix of OR and machine learning, and some example of projects that I actually were actively working on now with some funding as well. Uh, so one is one of my PhD students who graduated last year. Uh, we developed um, a, a, sol a software essentially to support um, cardiologists um, decide on the suitability of a patient who is uh, affected by a specific heart condition, whether they can be installed an implant or not. So it's decision support tools, which involve a lot of tools from um, machine learning, deep learning, and also some OR techniques for like hyperparameter optimization and things like that. And then the second one, which I just got some funding for just in the last few days to proceed further is we're developing a, a tool. So basically there's something which builds up on the whole of ships when they are sailing, um, which is called bow fouling. And that can have a very uh, detrimental effects on the performance of the engines and also pollutes water environment and so on. So basically, the, after a certain time, they, they, they have to go for dry dock where the, the ship has to be clean. So the, the, the question is, what's the best time to clean? 
because as dye fouling is building up, the ship start consuming more, uh, more, more fuel. So you want to we 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 we, we build um, a proof of concept of an, an optimization build tool data driven so we 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 build a forecasting uh tool to input uh the prediction of fuel con of fuel consumption which can help decide how uh critical the build the bow falling has built up uh such that um it can be incorporated in the tools um of a of a shipping company to decide what's the best time to to clean a ship so that's something we are actively working on uh with a company base in the isle of Wight, which is an island just near us in southampton here so mm -hmm. we are hoping that it will get to a point where maybe the company uh can maybe adopt it or, or whatever so those are some of the things that i find quite I find quite interesting that we we kind yeah. of go from very maybe abstract research to some very concrete things um yeah absolutely it sounds like quite relevant work um mm. but you mentioned machine learning uh, uh several times what is the relationship between bi-level optimization and machine learning and what research opportunities you see in this uh, relationship so um i i'm my my one of my most recent project uh which started in november last year november 2023 it's on it's a uh, feasibility study with a very prominent uh, machine learning expert, um, Massimiliano Pontil, who used to be here at UCL, now has joined position between UCL and IT, uh, IIT in Italy. So we are what we are trying to do, he's done some really a lot of uh, very um, prominent work on applications of bio optimization in machine learning. So we have a pro joint project with a postdoc who is working now with us to help map um, applications of um, bio optimization in machine learning because there are just so many. Um, so, so, but one aspect that I've been working on already with some of my PhD students is uh, actually is hyperparameter optimization. So, because in machine learning, um, to identify the best training model, for example, for a for, for a prediction um, uh, model, um, you, you, the typical techniques that you use are called grid search. A random search or maybe Bayesian optimization. So essentially, you have hyperparameters in your training model that it's very difficult to find what's the best one to get your classification algorithm, for instance, to work well. And grid search, you can more or less formulate that as a the, the grid research process you can essentially formulate that as a bi-level optimization problem so essentially you have you, you have a data set you split that into your training and your validation set that validation set you can use to build your upper level optimization problem which as its job is essentially to find this the best value of the or values depending on how many you have in your training problem of your hyperparameter so why grid search is more or less a heuristic, bio optimization allows you to find optimal values if your algorithm is to work well. So that's uh, really like one of the entry points of bio optimization in, in, in machine learning, I would say. Yeah, it seems very exciting. And I'm really <laughs> uh, looking forward to seeing the progress in the, in the next few years. You have been providing early career advice for members of the OR Society in the UK. How rewarding this has been? Yeah, so uh, since a few years, um, yeah, I've been involved in activities around uh, the OR Society. So um, basically, we have um, a young committee of OR earlier career academics. So they organize different types of activities uh, where we, we often run activities like maybe around sharing experience on writing grants or writing papers and, and things like that. So, um, yeah, so I, I often um, take part in them to share experience to, to early careers, post PhD student, postdoc or academics were still at the beginning. And um, yeah, it's, it's a really quite um, an interesting uh, experience, I would say. Mm -hmm. So, Alan, you have been away from Cameroon for so many years now. Uh, uh, what are you doing to, to stay connected with your country? And uh, 
what type of activities you have been involved to get people to follow your steps? So basically, I mean, um, I think my, my journey uh, getting away from Cameroon to do my PhD and getting into academia, one of the probably most challenging part of it was post PhD looking for uh for, for postdoc positions was was a bit challenging because it's not something i had done before so and uh, so i i went and i have phd student today myself so i don't I, any opportunity that i have to share my experience on kind of giving tips to to to, to current phd student to watch on things that they do to prepare so so i'm been trying the last few years to do a bit of that with so I have colleagues in different countries. Um, we're trying to supervise a co-supervise PhD student with them there in Cameroon. So we're trying to uh, we don't have much I mean, we don't have a lot of uh, experts in optimization, for instance, or are in Cameroon. So I'm collaborating with colleagues to, to train some PhD student in that. And one aspect that I really try my best to get into is to, whenever there's an opportunity to give, some, for instance, one of the things I did very recently is I um, work on a, on a talk. Uh, we have a cohort of uh, PhD students with some colleagues in the US, uh, the University of Chan that you might remember. So I did a kind of training like seminar or workshop or something like that where i prepare a talk to just give them tips things tips, things to watch out for to develop their profile to prepare for the after phd because you can easily get carried away by your research um then you forget the after because the PhD by itself, it, it doesn't give a job. You have to look for the job, right? So, so it's something I've found really so fulfilling uh, because you can easily take that for granted. But when I think about my own experience, I just feel there are certain things when you're doing your PhD, if you really pay attention to them, it should facilitate your process of, um, of, of getting a job afterward. And also even just tips on how to look for for job post PhD. So those are something, some of the things that I'm really quite interested in. And I've been trying to share my experience with people from Cameroon and maybe other places um, as much as I can. Yeah. Wow. So yeah, this is a very interesting and fantastic initiative. I think the people of Cameroon can learn a lot from your experience. You know, the idea of giving it back is also very, very uh, relevant. And, you know, you're a role model now. So people can follow your steps and, and try to be successful in their endeavors. So yeah, congrats, Alan, on this, really. What do you do in your spare time these days? I still play football. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, as much as I can, I play football. I try to swim a bit. I think I've got to an age where I'm starting feeling the age. So I start to try to learn new things. So um, yeah, I cycle a bit as well, uh, but I, I I try not to miss football. Uh, yeah, every week I play football every Monday. Uh, cycle a bit. My kids do a bit of swimming as well. Um, yeah. So yeah. So you try to stay physically active somehow. Best as I can. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Alain, uh, would you like to give a final message to our young viewers and listeners? Um, yeah, so um, really, Anand, th thank you really so much for, for the opportunity that you've given me. Um, I, I, I'm not sure. So this is my first, by the way, interview experience. I was very reluctant to get into it, uh, but I hope... I think that you and I had a conversation before and I, and I, and I, what really finally convinced me to do this is that hopefully um, maybe I've done some things which could be positive possibly. And maybe uh, what I've done hopefully can inspire some, some one, one, one or two people that will, that will be, um, that will be great. And I guess if I've managed to have some success, I would say it's probably thanks to um maybe it's my personality i don't know i i try to not wait for opportunities to come to me so i try to go and grab opportunities wherever 
I have the impression that I can find him somewhere. So, and I, I, and I think that's what, when I get the opportunity to talk to uh, early career researchers or PhD students, that's a message that I get them to, um, because as I mentioned, my own experience looking for academic job, that's where you realize that every little thing you do, attending conferences, trying to organize workshops, uh, supporting organization of event, taking part in things. It's all those little things that sometimes can make a difference. Um, and I and I and I hope that um yeah, it's it's um because sometimes I feel that you might I mean, everybody had, has their chances and their opportunities. For some people, it might take longer. Um, well, what I'm just trying to say is, if you really know what you want to do and where you want to be at a certain time, uh, you rather try to start to build, to build that part yourself rather than waiting uh, for an opportunity, which potentially eventually might come, but maybe a bit late. Um, so if you want to accelerate your career, I think, um, you just try to to push yourself, try to look for opportunities, go and grab them rather than waiting for them. Yeah. So in a mm. nutshell, instead of waiting for the opportunities, you have to create your own opportunities. Exactly. Yeah. That's uh, probably the briefest way <laughs> I did <laughs> manage to put it. <laughs> All right, Alain. Uh, it was uh, amazing to have this conversation with you. Um, I'm, I'm so glad you have accepted to, to take part in the series. Uh, it's, it's an honor. You were a great guy. You were doing a lot uh, in our field, especially uh, when it comes to bi-level optimization and how uh, it's, it's a relationship with machine learning. So uh, I wish you, you know, all the best. And uh, I hope we can meet uh, in the near future in person. Thank you very much, and then um, it was really an honor for me to be here. When I see the caliber of uh, guys you've had in your in, in your in your podcast, I think um, yeah, it's just an honor to to have been given this opportunity as well. Thank you very much. Yes, thanks a lot once again. If you're coming to Brazil, you know where to find me. You know, you also know Valton, which was my uh, mm -hmm. former master student and he did PhD at the University of Southampton so you know a couple of Brazilians around of course you know the guys in you know at IMPA and other places mm, so mm, uh, mm, be sure to go reach yeah. me and to contact us so we can arrange mm. something okay so all yeah. the best and uh, hope to meet you in person soon ciao thank you thank bye. you very much and thanks bye bye bye